Hi, everybody. This is the third part in the series, Beware of Those Who Constantly Talk About Sin. The third example is The Man Born Blind, about whom we read in John 9. Let's have a look. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Jesus answered, It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Let's pause here. So, first, it's the disciples who suspect that sin is the reason for his condition. Jesus does not rebuke them for this question, however. It was understandable, because they knew that in the Ten Commandments it says that the iniquities of the fathers would be visited on the children on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate God. Jesus makes it clear, however, that our perception of what the underlying reason is for someone's condition can be very wrong. Then Jesus heals the man. I'll continue reading from verse 13 on. They brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly blind. Now it was a Sabbath on the day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also were asking him again how he received his sight. And he said to them, He applied clay to my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Therefore some of the Pharisees were saying, This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said to the blind man again, What do you say about him, since he opened your eyes? And he said, He is a prophet. The Jews then did not believe it of him, that he had been blind and had received sight, until they called the parents of the very one who had received his sight and questioned them, saying, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? Then, how does he see now? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. For this reason his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So a second time they called the man who had been blind, and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He then answered, Whether he is a sinner I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. So they said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You do not want to become his disciples too, do you? They reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, Well, here is an amazing thing, that you do not know where he is from, and yet... He opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you teaching us? So they put him out. Jesus heard that I had put him out, and finding him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and he is the one who is talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Now to the Pharisees. In the first part of the series, we saw that their motive was to trap Jesus. The second episode showed 
how they like to analyze other people's sins while at the same time praise their own virtues in order to make themselves feel spiritual. Here we will find yet another aspect, and that is that people who constantly hold other people's sins against them use this as a means of exercising power and control. This is especially true for church leaders or leaders of any Christian group or organization. To make it clear right from the start, this was never the blueprint for the church. Jesus said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. A very blatant example is the Catholic Church. They tell their members that they cannot be assured of total forgiveness of their sins ever, their whole lives, and that even in the afterlife they still got to pay for them in purgatory. They have two classes of members, the clergy and the laity. The clergy has the power to forgive sins temporarily, those that were confessed to them, until the next time. They themselves do not seem to be in need of confession and seem to be above the common church member. However, this pattern also exists in evangelical churches. In the church where I came to faith, there was a regional youth meeting once a year over Pentecost. All youth group members of a state got together for a few days over the long weekend. It took place in a big town hall. It was always exciting to meet many other believers the same age, and there was an atmosphere of joy and excitement as people arrived. Lots of chatting going on at the entrance of the big hall. Then came the first sermon. It was the same every single year. The sermon always went something like this. Well, you're surely excited to be here and fellowship with people your age from other churches in other cities. How nice that you're happy to meet others and how nice that you have believed the gospel. But we got to talk about serious matters here. We got to talk about sin in your life. There's a lot of unconfessed sin in your life. That hinders God from blessing you. So, if you want to be blessed and used by God, you've got to confess all sins that come to mind. Reason to mourn instead of being happy. After that sermon, there was a front of elders from the church lining up in front of the podium with a very solemn and serious look on their faces, ready to listen to all the confessions of the willing who were bold enough to come forward. Alternatively, you were also allowed to confess to somebody sitting next to you. The whole atmosphere of excitement and joyful expectation was gone. It was put a damper on, and everybody left the first session with their heads hanging. Keeping people in fear and bringing them under condemnation again and again by constantly reminding them of their sins, instead of telling them the gospel and the riches they have in Christ, is a means of exercising power and control. After Jesus had healed the blind men, the Pharisees interrogate the man's parents. The parents don't dare to tell them that it was Jesus who healed him. We read, His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. So, the Pharisees used their position of alleged sinlessness to instill fear in people and to exercise control. This is what is described in Galatians 4, verse 17. They eagerly seek you, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out so that you will seek them. Their tactics worked. To be put out of the synagogue was dreaded. They ruled through fear. I already mentioned the Catholic Church. I was raised Catholic. I became a believer when I was 15 years old, and shortly after that I led my younger brother to the Lord. After a while, we decided to talk to our mother. We showed her from Scripture that salvation is by faith alone, not by works, and that works were only a result of salvation. 
we tried what we could with the Bible knowledge we had back then. Our mother listened without saying a word. When we had finished explaining the biblical view, she said, But there's a snack to it. We were on the edge of our seat, ready to counter any Bible passage she would quote with a scripture refuting it. However, to our surprise, she didn't object to anything we had showed her from scripture. She simply said, The only thing is, just in case the Catholic Church is right after all, I would be eternally condemned. I don't dare take that risk. Our hearts sank. What can you do against that? That is the spirit of fear and condemnation. The Catholic Church uses fear to exercise power over their members. What's also interesting is how the Pharisees define sin here. They say about Jesus, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. They do not understand what Jesus said in Mark 2, namely, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. They cling to the letter, which kills, but they do not understand the spirit of the law. They see the shadow as the goal and fail to receive the one who is the reality of it all. By the way, there is an interesting parallel to today. Today also, the ones who say that the Christian walk is by grace alone and doesn't have anything to do with law-keeping, face the same judgment from modern-day Pharisees. They say, these people are not from God because they want a license to sin, because they do not teach that now we are able to keep the commandments and this is in fact what determines a true believer. Nothing new under the sun. They have, not, they have no understanding about the weightier matters of the law, which I mentioned in my last video, part two, mercy being one of them. Just like Jesus had mercy on the adulterous woman, the tax collector in the temple, he also had mercy on the blind man. The Pharisees didn't. Later, they say to the healed man, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. So here is what the self-righteous mindset of calling everyone else a sinner with the exception of themselves, ultimately leads to. They even call the Son of God a sinner. They want the Father while rejecting the Son. Well, 1 John 2, 23 tells us, Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. After the man had been healed by Jesus and after he had told the Pharisees that if Jesus wasn't from God, he could do nothing, they answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you teaching us? Here we see two things. They think they know who is a sinner. Again, they make a distinction between the measure of sin they suppose is present in the man's life. They say he was entirely born in sin. While they might, might not negate completely the fact that they themselves aren't born sinless, they falsely assume that they are way better off because, so the reasoning goes, they have been spared an obvious judgment of God. Once having established their moral superiority, we see another interesting point. They refuse to receive the witness of the healed man based on him being a real bad sinner in comparison to themselves. What had happened? The blind man had objected to what the Pharisees had concluded and said that Jesus couldn't possibly be a sinner, otherwise God would not have heard him. He said that he had to be from God. Now, what do the Pharisees do? They refuse to be taught by anybody else whom they think is morally inferior to them. You were born entirely in sins, and are you teaching us? Does that sound familiar? It is the same reasoning schema as today, that goes somehow like this. You, with your license to sin, saying we cannot now keep Jesus' commandments, want to tell us about Jesus? We don't need puffed-up teachers like you. As a matter of fact, we do not need any teachers at all. 
we do not follow man. The blind man, with his testimony of complete healing through Jesus alone, posed a threat to the religious system of control established by the Pharisees and to their authority. Keeping people in fear and establishing a special righteousness for oneself is how this whole system operates. Total freedom through Jesus would place everyone on the same level and would topple the religious building artistly erected with its clear power structures. The result of it is the healed man gets put out. Now, this was a big deal. There weren't alternative synagogues to pick and choose from. But he doesn't care a bit. He wasn't part of the system yet anyways, so he doesn't miss it. And he meets Jesus outside of the synagogue, that is, outside of the system, and has his own authentic worship experience with him right there. Jesus is interested in those who find themselves outside of the system. When he hears that the man had been put out because he had given testimony of him, he goes looking for him. He will do the same for you. He will come and fellowship with you when you find yourself outside of the system. In contrast to their son, the parents are gripped by fear of losing the fellowship that they had up to until then, the only one they knew. They do not dare talk about what Jesus had done because they think they cannot risk losing the only religious fellowship they know. Having been stuck in pharisaical systems of control for a long time makes it difficult to see them for what they are and to become bold. But once Jesus starts opening your eyes, as he did with a blind man, you can no longer be pressured to play your assigned role in the system. As Romans 8 tells us, we have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but a spirit of adoption. Now, why is it that people point to everybody else's sins, apart from the fact, as we have already seen, that they feel morally superior by doing so, and that it gives them power and serves as a control mechanism? If you're around them for only a little while, you'll find out that they hate when people rejoice in their freedom in Christ, or even if they're just enjoying life or having fun. Why is that? Well, most likely, they themselves are miserable underneath the surface, their smart appearance, their facade of a nice, fruit-producing Christian who's absolutely got sin under control. Picture two young kids, siblings, Peter and Susan. Their rooms are a mess. Daddy tells Peter, go tidy up your room. You can bet that Peter, when he is being told that, will immediately complain and say, what about Susan? Her room's a mess too. You gotta tell her to clean it up as well. I'm sure anybody with more than one child can relate. That is the mechanism that is effective in situations like these. You don't want others to be free and happy when you feel you're under pressure to perform. I remember a scene in a pizza place when I was a teenager. We went with a little youth group of our church. I sat at a table with some girls and we were having a great time laughing and giggling. Our youth group leader had just gone to the counter or something and when he came back, he quoted Ephesians 5.4 and there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. The piece of pizza got stuck in our throats, we choked, and the good time was over in a split second. We looked down on our plates feeling guilty, for nothing really. That was exactly what he wanted to achieve. So, it is very interesting to see what scripture tells us about the motives of the Pharisees. The main point is that they thought about themselves that they were righteous and that they looked down on everybody else as being sinners. And, as we have seen, by criticizing others, they elevate themselves. It is still the same today. There are those who think they have to constantly warn others not to practice certain sins. 
there are two groups. Those that say, if you don't confess or forsake your sins, you will lose your salvation, or that that is proof you weren't even saved in the first place. And those that say, no, you won't lose your salvation. Salvation is by grace alone, but you will lose rewards. This latter group is way more subtle. Many of them seem to be so humble, and they have the gospel right, don't they? They're just concerned, right? They might say something like, No, you won't lose your salvation. You can choose to live as a carnal Christian who doesn't have sin under control, or you can choose not to serve God, but too bad for you, sorry, you'll lose your rewards. What they do not say, but imply, is, well, I choose to fight against my sin, or I confess it regularly so that I might be forgiven, and as for me, I serve the Lord. The question here is, do we actually choose to serve God at our own timing, or does he call us in his own timing when he can finally actually use us? Did Moses choose to serve God when he was in Midian? Or did God in his own timing choose him? What would have happened if Moses had said to himself, I'm going to go to Pharaoh now and try to convince him to treat the Israelites better? He would not have achieved anything. We already talked about the motives of the Pharisees. We read about that in Galatians 2 verse 4. But it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in, who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. It's all impure motives, sneaking in, spying out. They're hiding their true intentions, which is not to help, see people freed, even if it sounds like that on the surface, for, after all, they are so concerned about your spiritual well-being, right? No, their intention is to bring believers into bondage. Talking about the parents of the healed man, I already mentioned chapter 4, verse 17, where it says, They eagerly seek you, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out, so that you will seek them. Now, this can have a practical implication, like, if you don't become a member of our church, you won't be able to participate in all sorts of meetings or activities, or it can be way more subtle. Those that constantly talk about sin and constantly feel the need to warn you of the consequences oftentimes get the desired reaction from their listeners, which is, Oh, thank you for telling me. I can see it myself now in scripture how I am being exhorted everywhere to deal with sin, focus on it, fight against it, or else... Thank you for pointing this out. I'll get to work immediately and will stay away from anybody telling me all I have to do is focus on Jesus. Then they'll receive a reply like, exactly, that is what we are commanded to do. They're first making others feel bad and condemned, and then, once they have succeeded in bringing them into bondage, offer them the solution, do as I tell you. I have the right scripture interpretation, and you will be on the right path. This way, they bind them to themselves. We should never do that. We should always point people to Christ. Only he can set free. But, as I said, the language is very subtle, and it all sounds very spiritual and humble. Now, let's read the rest of the chapter. And Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, so that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. Those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and said to him, We are not blind too, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say, We see, your sin remains. It is interesting what Jesus says here. He says, For judgment I came into this world. 
However, in John 3, verse 17, it says, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And in John 12, 47, we read, And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. That sounds like a contradiction, right? I made this short where I asked that question, whether Jesus is contradicting himself here. Some of you shared your thoughts on this. First of all, let's see what exactly the judgment is that Jesus brings about in the Pharisees. Although they see, they'll become blind. Since they say, we see, their sin remains. What does Jesus mean by this? The blind man knew he needed Jesus to heal him and open his eyes. The Pharisees were self-sufficient and self-righteous. They were oblivious to their spiritual need. They didn't think they needed Jesus. That was their sin. But it is true that at his first coming, Jesus didn't come to judge but to save. At his second coming, he will come to judge his enemies. So, what exactly does this judgment at his first coming consist of then? When we continue to read in John 3, we read, He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light, and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light, so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Jesus isn't actively judging people. It is his mere presence that brings to light what is in men. He is the light and exposes what's in people's hearts. This light divides. Those who do not want to be exposed hide and do not come to him. Not believing in him is their judgment. But those who believe are not judged. Similarly, in John 12, in verse 48, we read, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word I, that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Again, Jesus does not actively judge them. It is his word that does. But, of course, he is the word. Again, it is his presence that divides. And even at his second coming, when he will come as the judge, what do we read in Revelation 19? Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he would strike the nations. So, both at his first and at his second coming, it is his word that will judge and divide. No contradiction there. So, having looked at the Pharisees in this series so far, who love to point to other people's sins and think of themselves that they are righteous due to keeping the letter of the law while neglecting its weightier matters, what is the advice Jesus gives us regarding them? He says in Matthew 5, 20, For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That does not at all mean that we need to have even less outwardly visible sin than they, but what it means is that we need a totally different kind of righteousness. We need the imputed righteousness of Jesus, and that was what they had rejected, and people like them still reject today. <laughs>